also, of course, thanks to AMFAR, uh, amazing uh, organization and staff that have uh, generously supported uh, our work in this in this institute. We are the largest um, grant in the in the AMFAR family, uh, and we treat that as a serious uh, responsibility on our part to make sure that we're uh, that we're good partners and making uh, good progress. So uh, thanks for uh, the the AMFAR uh, group. But we need a cure for all of the people living with HIV who can't get to undetectable. We need a cure for all of the people living with HIV who don't have access to regular health care. We need a cure for all of the people living with HIV who find it really hard to adhere to medications over long periods of time. We need a cure for all of the people living with HIV who can't afford a lifetime worth of treatment. So all of this research costs money. And uh, AVAC, the AIDS Vaccine Advocacy Coalition, does an amazing job of tallying up how much money is spent on cure research. And they started that work in 2012. And uh, it was about $88 million worldwide. That's not a lot of money for research. You can see it's just about quadrupled in, in these seven years on that, um, on that graph here. And, and it really speaks, I think, to the interest that the research community has in this increased faith in the idea that cure research is a worthwhile investment. I think one of the more, most exciting things that um, I think is, is coming out of AMFAR right now is a really intensive study to look at post-treatment controllers. So we're calling it Project PTC, a name that I love. Um, and so in our Project PTC uh, group, we just um, funded this recently, we've um, collected uh, 50 participants who are post-treatment controllers. And I think it's really going to give us a chance to really explore the mechanisms um, so we think we know something about the way elite controllers control, but the way that post-treatment controllers control uh, is, is not known at all. And so this intensive look through Project PTC, I think, is going to give us some answers. For some reason, and we haven't quite figured this out, when she was infected, uh, the amount of virus that is left in her body now, decades later, is extremely small, so small that we had to send off billions and billions of cells to various different investigators, mainly in Boston. She came in, she had a leukapheresis, she's had a gut biopsy and so forth. And I think we found, I think her, her colleagues in Boston found in her entire body so far about a dozen or so viruses, all of which are defective, none of which actually can replicate. They're all dead. They're all, they sit in this part of the chromosome where sort of viruses go to die, this sort of big graveyard in our DNA for old viruses that go back millennium. And, and she's got a, that's where all her viruses are now. And even those that are there, as far as I understand, they're kind of beat up and, and, and mutated and they can't do anything. No one has ever, we've not seen this in anyone else. One of the intriguing ways about um, how your situation has been described is right. have you been cured? And you mm -hmm. have had comments about the extent to which you think you're cured. Well, you know, I've been involved in some really wonderful networks of activists for many years. And I would say for the last five or six years, we've gone back and forth on terminologies, you know cure with a small c, cure with a capital C, remission. Um, now in my case, you know, it's been suggested clearance. Um, Dr. Deke said I kicked it to the curb. And so the kind of general scheme of the, um, of the combination approach uh, that's being taken in the AMFAR trial is to really use a number of different modalities to really try to address all of these, all of these things that we need to think about when we want to make a functional T cell response. Ultimately, we hope this combination of interventions is going to result in kind of enhanced T cell responses against the virus. So this is what we're trying to do to redirect these things using anti-HIV antibodies. It's a very exciting field because, as Steve mentioned, these are incredibly powerful. And I mean, these are you know curing people in the you know stages of otherwise incurable cancers. And you know they went into trials, you know, with just with altruism and not really thinking they'd have much benefit and have done really well. 
People heard about CRISPR-Cas9, is that something folks know about? So these idea of molecular scissors, right? And there's, a, there's actually a bunch of different classes of scissors. This is the most famous these days, Cas9, there's other ones. But can we just go in, you know, here's this provirus that's integrated into the chromosome, right? And that's where all the new viruses come from. What if we went in with these scissors and just clipped out a part of it, or maybe the whole thing, or maybe we just, you know, took it completely out, and then there's no HIV? You know, if we could really do that effectively, that's truly a cure. So what if we could do this directly within the body so that each person becomes their own sort of production laboratory? And this is what we call in vivo gene therapy. It's within the body. And so I want to call out the efforts of, of AMFAR in this because uh, a couple of years ago now, um, they established a consortium uh, among the AIDS Research Consortium on HIV Eradication of Subtype Gene Therapy. And the idea was to develop, to bring together really leaders from around the world, and I was lucky enough to be part of this together with the folks you see here, um, to not only look at gene therapy for HIV, but to get ahead of the curve and say, can we actually make this simple so that we can get this to everybody who needs it? But keep doing what you're doing because it's going to pay off in the end. We will end the HIV epidemic, we will find a cure for HIV, and the world will be better for it. Thank you for your time.